Welcome to Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, editor-at-large of CBSMoneyWatch.com. I'm joined by... Jack Otter, executive editor of CBSMoneyWatch.com. And the award-winning, prolific book writing. Actually, the book she wrote is so heavy that it is the only <laughs> book that keeps the door of my apartment open. That I had to, I, I used to. I needed to use it as a prop. That is a valuable use I, my, of a book. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> I had the, her tome. This is Jane Brian Quinn, by the way, who um, has written not one, but not two, but three books. Sally, put the pictures up of the books. We also could actually, uh, why is there no picture of you on that third book? Making your most most of your money. It's on the back cover. Oh. You have to switch because it. Because right? what would be cool is if you wrote a series of books and the hair was different in each one, and we could kind of track your your hairdresser's progress. That in fact was done once with uh, <laughs> column when I was writing columns for Newsweek magazine. <laughs> they, uh, they because it went way like it went back for you know more than twenty years, and somebody did a piece flipping through. All my hair does really <laughs> very funny. That's good. Was, I like it that. It was a smart idea. No, well, and you know, and and you know, not original, obviously, on my part. What are well. you going to do? Okay, so Jane Brian Quinn is a nationally known commentator on personal finance, finance books, columns, millions of Americans. She's got a zillion awards. She also blogs for us here at Money Watch. Jack, that was kind of a coup. What, and what and she went to Middlebury College, which is worth That's mentioning. Oh, absolutely. really? One Why? Question. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's all brown people here. So for once, Middlebury out. Oh, uh, right, we have a secret handshake. I <laughs> love that. Um, so anyway, I also want to point out to you that Jane blogs for MoneyWatch.com. You can see her blog. It's called Make the Most of Your Money. And um, Sally, can you get that screenshot up there? Look at this. She's got prolific stuff. She sometimes writes things that get people a little angry. I notice some of the comments get you get you really you know how to really peeve people sometimes, especially if you're hard on the industry. That's true. Isn't that I, terrible? I'm afraid from now from time to time I get something from an insurance agent. Is, they don't like you. They don't like me very hmm. much. But but there are things that I like within the insurance com companies, and so they just have to keep on reading the column. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Find I mean, the ones that are good. That's right. And you can't like everybody. I mean, you're you're a commentator. You have to you put your people first, right? That's right. You know, consumers well, first. Consumers first. And um, speaking of that, we um, have a, a Jack. You brought this up before we came on the show that there's a a something circulating in the community about the F word. And it's your favorite word and Jane's second or third favorite word, so I thought it would be worth bringing up. Exactly. So, so bring it up, uh, man. A number of organizations that represent financial advisors and registered, in, was it RIAs, Registered yes, Investment, Investment Advisor, advisor. Uh, are pushing the SEC to make the fiduciary standard the rule for brokers. So the guys in the boiler room have to have your best interest at heart you know, when they call to sell you a stock. You're going to get hate mail from stockbrokers <laughs> now because he's saying that every stockbroker is in the boiler room. That's not, not nice. Not at all. I just said that particular that, class of stockbroker. There it is. I heard Sally Krawcheck speak in Washington on f Friday, I guess it was, yeah. and she said that she thought that she was in support of that and brokers should have to meet the fiduciary standard. And she's got a herd of... 15,000 bulls for Merrill Lynch now that she's in charge of. She, she runs the, I guess, the asset management arm of, of Bank of America now. And I, I questioned her about it afterwards, and she, I must say, she was very, very sure of herself on stage, and then she kind of <laughs> backed off a little bit. I mean, she was sure of herself, but she sort of turned it against me rather than actually answering the question. She said she wanted to wait and see how they define fiduciary standard. I was just about mm -hmm. to say that, Jack. Everyone says fiduciary standard, but what they want the SEC to do is define the fiduciary <clears throat> standard down yes. so that it is <laughs> they want not as down. protective as it is right now. And this is very difficult because also, you know, a large number of Republicans in the Congress have written letters to the SEC saying, we don't want this fiduciary standard. You should leave brokers alone. Okay, and so, so it's a big issue. And we can be back up one second. And Jane, just describe to everybody what fiduciary standard requires of the financial professional? It requires first that you put your customer's interest first, not your own interest first. Uh, currently, they can put their own interest first, and all they have to do is get you something that is suitable. And even if it's more expensive, if, if it's suitable, it's still okay. If they have to put your interest first they and they have something lower cost, basically, they have to give it to you. The other thing is um, full disclosure of all the costs and fees is part of fiduciary standard, of course that which is not necessarily part of the suitable standard. Right. <laughs> and, and that's... The, so to put that into dollars and cents for you, sometimes if your broker says to you, 
Yes, of course, Mrs. Jones. A 529 plan is an absolutely great idea, a great way for you to save for college. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sell you this particular 529 plan, and I, the broker, will get paid a commission on it. But they don't actually say that. They just sell it to you because it's a suitable investment for you and your family. Where it's as if that person were a fiduciary, he would have to say to you, Mrs. Jones, I would think 529 is a great plan. Now, if I sell you this thing, I'm going to make 500 bucks on the money you put in. However, you can go straight to your state and you can do it for free. And just go right there. You won't pay any fee. If you want me to do it, I'll get paid just for the convenience factor. But otherwise, you can do it yourself. And how many brokers are going to have that conversation if they don't have to? Oh, uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, let me think about that one. <laughs> you ask such hard questions. I know. <laughs> I know. And so, th- so w- what we what's kind of important here is that, as Jane said, it's not just the fiduciary standard as it is written today is a very hard standard to you know with which to comply. And if it does get watered down. It doesn't mean the same thing. And then you're still going to have to ask, you have to come into all those meetings armed with those questions that are, uh, slight, I think, uncomfortable sometimes for consumers also, to Also, most ask. people just don't know to ask them. Right. Uh, Felix Salmon had a great column that I came home to and read after talking to Sally Krawcheck. Uh, somebody has produced this software program that will allow you to sort of dig down and see all the fees you're paying. So I just took it to a random Merrill Lynch account. The guy was had he was a he was a wealthy investor. He had about two point three million dollars. So it was a wrap account. And he was paying forty thousand dollars for the to to the financial advisor every year. Okay, that's fine until they started digging down and found that he paid two hundred and forty dollars per trade in commissions, Ooh. and he was paying loads on his funds. That's and of rough. course, you know, under a fiduciary standard, that that would probably be blatantly illegal. Uh, a pro- uh, under a fiduciary standard, that all it it would be possibly legal, but it all would have had to been disclosed, at which sure. point right. the customer would have said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> right. I don't exactly. want to do this. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so um, without further ado, because people are somewhat at sixes and sevens over some of these issues, they have Jane Brian Quinn here as an expert and we as the two knuckleheads who <laughs> support her. Um, let's go and dive into some of these great questions. So let's start with Pauline, who asks, how is the best way to take profits from the market on a day like we had on Tuesday? I can't even remember what happened Tuesday. I'm so exhausted right now. What happened Tuesday? The market was up. Okay, thank you. And I would have liked to take enough out of the market in profits to pay part of my annual expenses, but I don't know how. Today, the market's down. Those fleeting profits are gone. I want to be prepared the next time this opportunity arises. Jack is already cluck clucking and shaking his (laughs) cluck, cluck, cluck. Okay, Jack, go give Pauline a bit, a little bit of your nasty, bitter medicine. You're well, so unfun. Uh, I want to be a fun guy. In fact, I want to make Pauline's life much, much happier mm. so that she doesn't sit there saying, oh, my gosh, I missed that one moment where I would have made a few extra bucks. On the contrary, I want her to today and tomorrow and maybe next week take out enough money that will cover all of her expenses for maybe three, four, maybe even look five years down the road. She doesn't have to do that all next week. But I want her to, I just stood for or sat during an interesting presentation of something called liability-driven investing. And what the guy said was... That was interesting? Because that <laughs> title is really well, bad. Yeah, it's just true. <laughs> um, and his point was, you figure out exactly what your expenses are going to be, and you take out that money, and then you put them in an interest-bearing account that matures in that year. So if you if you figure okay I'm going to need forty five thousand dollars in 2013, then you put it in a two year bond as opposed to the money that I'm need next month, which is probably just going to be in a savings account. Mm-hmm. But my point is she wants to take all risk off the table for the next couple of years, and then she can enjoy those up days like Tuesday for the next three years, four years, and then slowly take money out. Uh, so that she's got it in the bank and ready to use. And now it may not surprise you, but Jane Bryan Quinn, also not a great market timer fan. (laughs) Not really. I mean, this is just not the way to be investing. Right. But whether it's in stocks or mutual funds, you are going to cost yourself more in transaction fees. You will never get the timing right. And you said, well, how can you be prepared to take advantage of something like that another time? Well, you can be prepared by knowing in advance when stocks are going to go up. (laughs) (laughs) And since (laughs) then... I mean, that's the only way of being prepared. And it's just crazy to be watching the stock market every day. Will you 
please take up knitting, a good bird watching. <laughs> yeah, bridge. Go, do, I mean, uh, do your job, you know, kiss right. your kids. Don't watch the stock market every day and don't try to, to make a few bucks on this day or on that day. You, you cannot beat the professionals at the game of trying to figure out what's the, what's the right time to buy and sell a stock on a 24-hour basis. Forget it. And you can't even beat the Get index. In the long term. And you can't beat the index. Right. right? You so, should be in the index. Right? right. Okay. So here's the other thing I, I will say, you know, putting my former trading hat on. If for some reason you have some big humongo stock position and you're not selling it for some weirdo reason, there are things you can do. If you're telling me that, like, I don't want my stock to go below a certain level, there are very specific types of orders you can place. If you have a bunch of stock and it's restricted, you can't even trade in it because your employer gave it to you. There are different things that you can do around that to trade around that. But I couldn't agree more that this just seems like spinning your wheels. But that's, you know, I think that's a great point. She could put in a market order. So whatever yeah. level it was at Tuesday, if that'll make it her feel better. Tell her broker to sell it when it hits yes, that Yes, and then I promise you, whatever that order is, that market order or that limit order or that stop loss order, as soon as it, get ex it gets executed, the market <laughs> will go exactly the opposite way and you curse us. <laughs> okay. In other words, it'll go up even farther and just right. say, I should have exactly. waited. Again. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Joe Z, not related to Jay Z, okay. sadly. Are you sure? We're about, no, but I'm thinking I don't know if Jay Z. <laughs> Uh, Victoria? No. No. Okay. Saying, uh, Joe Z says, we are about to convert around $300,000 into retirement income. It's supplementing $68,000 in guaranteed pension and annuities annually. I say that slowly because that's a rarity yeah, it's to a hear rarity, that, yes. right? It's a very solid, solid base to be retiring I'll say. on. Um, what is the consensus on using part of those that $300,000 for to put it into a managed payout fund as as those offered by Vanguard. How safe and reliable are they? Jane, what do we know about managed payout funds that we can help Joe Z with? Uh, a managed payout fund takes the money that you have and it says it will stretch it over a certain number of years or over your lifetime. The Vanguard funds say, we will give you a payout every month uh, and we'll change it once a year based on how the market is done and it's going to last for your lifetime. Fidelity has one that says we'll do the same thing but we'll just last a certain number of years. You tell us how many years you want the payout. Mm -hmm. And so then they invest it for you and and then they start paying you however much you want per month. You want $1,000 a month, they start paying it. If the market hasn't done so well, maybe in January they say, okay, we're going to give you $950 a month for the following year. And then the market does great, and they say, okay, we're going to give you $1,200 a month mm -hmm. for the following year. So they basically are parceling out the money so that it will last over your lifetime by their guess on how the investments come. So as an, as an idea, uh, I think that it is, I think it's a a reasonable way to think about taking your money uh, when you're in a payout, when you're retired and mm -hmm. you want to pay out from your, and you're letting them do the investing for you. It's, you haven't locked it up in an annuity. So right. they've got annuities and they say, I don't want more annuities. I, I want something with some flexibility so I can change my mind. Right. I think that's a reasonable way of doing it. Now, you, you're not going to get a guaranteed amount every every month. And so that's the thing. But they've got a pretty good base here. $68,000 a year is not bad. Yeah, I think a key point that people don't understand is that these are not guarantees. They are invested in the stock market and, and the bond market. So, and there's the bond a mix. market. Yep. There's a mix. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, but they can go down. They're, they're at the whim of the markets. But we, we did a story about these, and we came out kind of as you did. We said, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. They're not bad. But this guy, they're actually more appropriate for this guy than a lot of other people because he has these guaranteed benefits. So, yeah, I like putting a little risk out there under the management of a Fidelity or a Vanguard. How much are these funds? Uh, I Less than 1%? Percent? Probably. Probably. I mean, these are, yeah. I, mean I, I, I don't know about Fidelity. Yeah. I haven't looked at them. The vanguards are usually, yes, less than 1%. Okay, percent, very though. good. All right, so a uh, good alternative, especially with interest rates really low and people don't want to pop into annuities, even if they didn't have guaranteed income. This is an interesting for a portion of retirement income, supplemental income, stream of income. Yeah. Of course, as soon as there's a roaring bull market and everyone forgets about the downturn <laughs> and they don't really care about dependable income, these, they will market these right out of existence. Do, do you know, first, I, I'm not sure this is true, Jill, because first you've got to look at the demographics. You know, 
People are getting older, baby boomers moving into retirement. They've had two disasters in the past 10 years with the money that they had planned to retire on, 2000, 2008. Mm -hmm. And you are getting more people saying, uh, actually what Jack was talking about earlier, the idea of saying, I want to guarantee my expenses for a certain number yep. of years, or I want to guarantee them for as long as I can foreseeably see. They're calling this immunizing your... your um, Inoculating the portfolio. Right, exactly. Oh. Oh, oh, all these words. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so more people are saying, maybe I have been too aggressive with my... At retirement, at 65, you know, not at 30, but at 65. I, maybe I've been too aggressive. I lost all this money. Now I'm not... Or, I'm not living so well, or I've seen people not live so well. So they're saying, I should have more of my money in something conservative. Mm -hmm. This kind of plan that this person who just asked the question yep. did say, okay, I'm going to cover my expenses. I'm going to use an annuity. I'm going to use Social Security. And those are my basic expenses. And maybe I'm going to use more bonds to help cover my basic mm -hmm. expenses. And I'm going to have less stocks. And then if I live to 103, yeah, that's what my stocks are for way out there. In the meantime, I've got more bonds, and they're going to cover my expenses tomorrow. Right. And I think that I think that income becomes very important, but I do think we get a little we'll see how this how we do it after this period. You know, it's not now. I'm sort of thinking if in two or three years from now it'll be interesting to see if people are really really have changed in the way they approach their investing. I think you're right. There is a group that really have, and then there's, of course, the group of amnesia. Yeah, but, but the, when people <laughs> get older, Jill, they mm. kind of change their mind. I would hope so. I would hope so. you got to learn something, <laughs> yeah, well, for God's exactly. sakes, it's right? It's too late for a while. Oh, water, my but God. They, but they act, they get, they get more scared, which is a reasonable thing to be when you're saying, my paycheck is right. stopped. This is yeah. all I'm going to live on. And by the way, if only they were a little more scared and their accumulation phase. They that probably would, would have nice. more money. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Barbara, who is a U U.S. citizen living permanently in Canada. Probably for the cheap drugs, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. All right, maybe not. I may apply for my Social Security retirement this year, but I might get a job soon in Toronto. Would the penalty for U.S. retirees earning over a certain amount apply if they earned the money in Canada? The answer is, because I called Social Security and I asked love this. this question, is yes, you yes. can't beat the uh, earnings test by having Canadian income instead of U.S. income. And the way they know is uh, they feed money. They, they feed it. it C Canada is connected with um, with the paycheck system in uh, in the United States. So Social Security, if they're going to send you your Social Security in Canada, they know where you are, they get your income, and they, right. they apply it. So, no beating that so it's, system. It's the same income test wherever you live, although Canada is a very nice country, and they have health insurance. They do, and that is fabulous. A little cold. <laughs> Great hockey, a little cold. Getting warmer, though. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> Every day. Um, we also got another Social Security question. I'm going to answer it only because we don't really, we're not sure we know the answer to this, but I find it um, because we don't know the answer. So we're going to look it up. And we're going to figure it out for next week. My husband started drawing Social Security benefits last April at his full retirement age. You usually get that, you know, 66, 67, keeps going up. Uh, and he continues paying Social Security tax because he works as a consultant contractor. What should he do in order to receive the highest possible benefit? Should he stop drawing and suspend until the age of 70? Please help. That's what Carol Lee wants to know. What do you think, Jack? Well, we know that if you find there are reasons that you would file for Social Security and immediately suspend it, and that has to do with spousal benefits. Um, whether you can file, take some paychecks, then decide to suspend and come back in at 70 and still get that maximum benefit, we're not sure. Yeah, and I'm telling you that um, uh, just so we're going to look this up because this is so exciting. Jane, you might want to put this on your calendar. On May 25th, we're having a special show completely devoted to Social Security. <gasps> oh, my God. Uh, it's like the Oscars of Ask the Experts. It's a, but, uh, because... but let me, I'll say just one thing about um, the, the fact that he's paying Social Security taxes now. Yep. That is going to increase his current benefit because right. they, Social Security does recompute what your benefit is if you've been paying in. So he'll get higher benefits even now, but it may be a better deal if he suspends in the same we don't know and and generally speaking if you can possibly wait just wait i mean if you have terrible health and you have no money then you take you take early benefits in, and i know that there are people who are in that situation but if you can possibly hang out and you can wait till you're 70 that's that's the better deal that's the better deal, better it, it deal. Is hard no for question. some people 
but the numbers are enormous. I mean, go to the calculators online and you'll see that if you live into your late 80s, you could be talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I think it's, is it 8% a year, 7% Yeah, I mean, it's like the best, yeah. it's the I mean, best return you could ever imagine, a, a, right? And, and not only the best return, guaranteed, guaranteed. and inflation adjusted. <laughs> Good. And, you know, if you wait, each year you wait, you get the increased inflation adjustment. That's plus right. The, plus the 7, 8% they're going to give you in an income. I mean, yeah. it's a fabulous deal. It is a darn it's good Bernie deal. Bernie Madoff, except Wait. you actually get it. <laughs> nice. Just Very about good. 11% Consistent. probably when you throw, <laughs> you know, average uh, let's, inflation. Let's talk about another uh, agency and within the government that people don't like so much. This is from Will. He says, hello, I recently received a notice from the IRS stating I had a tax liability for an earlier year when I was still married. Hmm, Okay. I'm divorced now. I'm curious to find out if I am solely responsible for this debt or is my ex-wife equally responsible? Here's a, like a little moment in time where you just don't want to have to make this phone call. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the terms of your divorce were. But uh, as someone who's gone through that and had to make a phone call for something sort of equally but annoyingly personal and awful, if you can afford not to make the call, don't make the call. But I think they're jointly but liable. They're jointly liable. If your ex-wife signed that uh, return. return, you are jointly liable. But the thing is that if she doesn't pay, they're still going to come after you. You, right, exactly. So. They're going to come after whoever responds first. I bet that she got the note also, though. I, I, she should have. She should have. Two social security numbers were on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, isn't that fun? I think your attorney calls her attorney. They sort it out, right? Yeah. I had to call and ask for a Jewish divorce after getting the divorce because I was getting remarried. And I was like, I know we just went through this horrible thing now. Can we go through it again <laughs> but with a rabbi? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like fun? Oh, my God. It was the worst call I ever made in, mm-hmm. in that marriage. Okay, <laughs> next up. Um, all right. This is interesting here. Um, my husband's credit score is 550, and I'm trying to help him raise it. He's trying to boost his credit score, but there aren't any credit cards that will approve him since his credit is so poor. I was told that there's some sort of prepaid debit card that may be beneficial to him. Is this the same as a secured credit card? Do you recommend this? Are they different? Please help. Any suggestions or advice? Greatly appreciated. You want to do a prepaid um, secured card? Uh, Well, a prepaid debit card... I think is a, a very valuable thing. It's a substitute for, for expensive bank accounts. And I mean, it's a, terf- it's a very valuable thing, but they don't report to credit bureaus. So a prepaid debit card is not going to help you improve your credit score. So you got to do the secured so credit gotta card. So you got to do the secured card. I don't see any way around that mm-hmm. one. And mm-hmm. so the secured card is a pain and it's expensive and you get maybe $500 worth of, uh, of uh, something, what you can charge. But mm-hmm. I think that that's the only way that you do it. You start doing that and you are very, very careful. Right. But, you know, an interesting question, of course, is that if he has such a, a rotten credit score, should she sign anything Never. with him jointly? Never. And the answer is Never. she should not. Never. Right? Because in theory, she could help him by putting them putting them Mm-mm. together, but don't do it. Don't do it, baby. Don't do it. <laughs> we don't want you to do that. I learned that from John Alzheimer when he okay. said, if you possibly can avoid it, if that person, yeah, as soon as you sign something together, car, house for a mortgage, anything, you are now infected with that evil, bad credit. Right. So we want to protect so, her. Because she said she wanted yep. to help him with his credit score. I just want to say, don't help him that way. No, exactly. <laughs> we have actually another another uh, question about this. So um, Anita says, uh, last week, I finally received my divorce. The damage is done. I moved out two years ago. I'm trying to correct my damaged credit. I paid spousal support for months. Then it turned out he wasn't paying the mortgage for two years. She must be on the mortgage. So I stopped per my attorney's advice, um, and now he's in talks with the banks on refinancing in an attempt to get the mortgage in his name only. Because they got divorced. Who would ever get divorced? What kind of horrible divorce lawyer doesn't get her off that mortgage in the divorce? Uh, Let me tell you, I happen to have this situation within my own family. Oh, no. And the fact is that you can't, so so you're divorcing and you're both on the mortgage, Yep. but uh, if one of you, you know, if, if the house is underwater and neither of you has enough mm. so that you can refinance it in your own name, right. you have the smartest divorce lawyer in the world and they can't get you off the mortgage because there is no bank that will just give you, give you, either one of you the mortgage in your own name. So that, you know, I'm, I'm can't knock their divorce lawyers here because that's exactly what might happen. Okay, but let me ask you, but generally speaking, if you're not underwater... 
right? Even if, like, I think the rule of thumb should be if you're not underwater and you don't have to show up to the bank, you you, you force the sale of the house and you're both done. Yeah, you could sell the house or you do right? the, I mean, the, but, but again, lots of people can sell the houses today. You know, mm-hmm. this is a really, when, when you look at what's happening in divorces now with, with, Homes underwater, with the market going nowhere, couple wants to split up, they're both on the mortgage, and they get this is a tie that binds simply <laughs> because the housing market is so crummy mm-hmm. that there's no way they can get out of it. They can't mortgage out of it, they can't sell out right. of it. So they get talk about unfortunate phone calls. Yeah. I mean they get stuck with with you know, and you have to keep trusting that, that one of them was gonna keep on paying his or her, her half of the mortgage all the time. Mm. And if they don't, you're stuck the way our Absolutely. Is. Um, Dana wants to know, where do we draw the line on being upside down in our house? Is there a percentage point that can be used as a guide to how far upside down on a house you can be and still be okay in the long run? What do you know, Jack? Wow. Uh, I mean, generally, if it's more than 20 or 25 percent... Uh, you're 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 in deep trouble, but I, I think I, I don't, I'm not sure what the point of her question is. In other words, is she really asking us when do I do the jingle mail trick, or is she just saying if I'm 20 percent under, will I eventually work my way out? Well, I think it's probably a little bit of both. So I think that um, when I I actually had this question a long time ago, and I asked a bankruptcy attorney, like in your experience, where is the line? Like where do you think people really should just walk? And basically say, ruin my credit for seven years, but walk because they're just not going to be able to get out in a reasonable period of time. He says, listen, you know, you really have to weigh whether that person can get housing and shelter for a price that's reasonable to them in their market. And so I think a lot of markets you can probably rent at a reasonable place. But he would he said 20 percent was if you're more than 20 percent underwater is the time where they usually say, hmm, you might want to think about sending that those keys back and make a different decision. What do you think, Jane? Well, do you know, so much of this is still a lifestyle decision. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a lot of people that may hear a number like that and they say, but I love my house. What am I going to go and rent somewhere else? I'm mm. going to hate the wallpaper and I can't change it. And so, and, and I'm going to keep on staying here. And you're just making me unhappy <laughs> saying that, oh, you may never get even, baby. But I mean, what are your you know, you have to say, what are you going to do as an alternative? Right. And if you're under any financial pressure, the answer is clearly to walk. If you're not under financial pressure and you're happy where you are, then you can maybe hang out. you yeah. just keep on, you know, and you say, okay, I, I didn't make money on my house. Uh, but a lot of people in the past never made money on their houses either. But it was a happy place for them to live, and they were glad to be there. Right. It was the right school district and <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So I wouldn't encourage people to get out of the house just based on something numeric. I think you'd get out of the house if it's based on something financial. Yeah. And if we do get raging inflation that James Grant and other people foresee, these will be the, the one happy group will That's, be these underwater uh, yeah, right. homeowners. That's the, right, exactly. Yeah. That's my, the, the price of my house, well, the value of my house has gone up and I haven't done anything. <laughs> you know? I, there also is a moral component to this that we've talked about. And, and there was a good column by Barry Ritholtz where he pointed out that uh, from the perspective of your bank in a business situation when they face a problem like this, there's zero moral concern. Um, the, the bank simply does do the equivalent of mailing back the keys. It's a contract. The contract says, if I can't pay it, you own it. And they they call that contract. That's right. So and so people should not feel too bad about making that decision if it really is in their best interest. I agree with that. Now, of course, there are some states where, in theory, they can come after you for the mortgage that for, that right. you still right. You got to be very careful so, about that. But but in the states where they, the, the the recourse state, the, the uh, non recourse states where they can't where you can mail in the keys and they can't come after you. Basically, you have already paid for the right to walk away because you pay a slightly higher interest rate if you get that kind of a mortgage. So speaking of the moral considerations, I don't think it occurs to people that they have paid for the right to walk away from their house in those states. Right. That's true. Um, Now you bring up inflation, Jack. I'm glad you did. Reza wants to know, I have a couple of questions regarding gold prices. What will the Fed do if gold soars to $2,000 per ounce? I say nothing. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> okay, let, right. let, we have consensus <laughs> on they that. Could, they there, could right. sell some gold. <laughs> All right. Um, is there any consequence with gold passing that number, 2,000, when it comes to inflation? And why 
Um, why are central bankers willing to buy gold in high prices and sell it low? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's also like Russia, which has, you know, some wild num- amount of, you know, gold in storehouses. It sells it to, you know, finance the military for 25 years. But that's not really what no, most do. No, I mean, do. central banks don't trade. They, 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 they acquire gold because they want a kind of a balance of reserves between currencies and gold and this and that. And, and so that has nothing to do with buying and selling. Although uh, there prices. was a lot of sovereign dumping of gold back when it was real cheap. Yeah. Uh, In pro- so. Yeah, like, whoops, that's a bad trade. Yeah. Um, what do you think about these people who are now, have they learned, has anyone really gotten into this whole idea that commodities can fall far faster than, <laughs> you know, we saw silver fall almost 20, I think it was 27% in one week. And you imagine that? Just let's translate. That's like 3,500 Dow points in a week. If that happened, we would be like freaking out and people would be going nuts. And yet I'm still getting inundated with calls from people who say to me or emails who say, oh, is it time for me to buy silver? Silver's down now. What do we tell them, Jane? I would tell them you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I don't. But you're not crazy if, if you have the idea that you should have some small percentage of your money in commodities. I mean, this is the thing. You, you say, oh, silver gold, you know, I should have oil futures, you know, whatever it is. That's the crazy part. But I don't, I do not think it's crazy for the average person to say when I'm looking at an asset allocation in my portfolio, I haven't, I've got enough money to do it. You know, it's not somebody who just has $10,000 in, you know, your IRA, but you've got more money than that to own a, a commodities, probably ETF exchange traded fund is a, as a whole long-term holding is a perfectly reasonable thing to do for some small percentage of your money. Right. But that's very different from chasing the, the price of silver up and down. Or trading and, it. And actively. one of my heroes, Jeremy Grantham, has just come out with his quarterly letter yeah. uh, in which he thinks that commodities are in a really long term, this guy thinks long term, a hundred year and probably beyond bull market that we've, ter- in terms of the, the human race, we've turned the corner where we're finally using a little more than we're able to produce and everything from corn to timber to gold. Um, but he thinks that the combination of a slowdown here and a big slowdown in China may very well drop prices before uh, before they start going higher And then again. if so, under that theory, that would be a good time to be accumulating uh, something in commodities. Although one thing about these, uh, the exchange-traded funds are, are much are cheaper than the commodity mutual funds, open-ended funds. So that's why I'm talking about the exchange-traded funds for them. But some of them are 75% in oil. <laughs> so when you're looking at a, uh, at a, quote, commodities investment, you've got to see what's in it. Because right. you want it to have, you know, metals and grains and oil. There's, you don't want it to be a, basically an oil fund. I know there are two primary indexes, and I always forget which one is more heavily energy-related. There's, I think... The Goldman Sachs yeah. Commodity Index. And then the Dow Jones? And the Dow Jones Index. And I think the Dow is more oil. Okay. And but you know what? Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to say. Oh, uh, our producer wants me to tell you that you can ask us a question live in the chat room at MoneyWatch.com. Sorry about that. Um, so. Um, oh, by the way, our producer, our wonderful producer Victoria, yes. said, uh, "Be sure to tweet it." She said. <laughs> so there I you did. Go. All I right. Did. <laughs> there you go. We got a zillion questions. So I mean, it's fantastic. Um, so and you can always send us a question at moneywatch.com. There's a little cl- click, ask the experts at the top right corner of the site. You can send us an email, ask the experts at moneywatch.com. You can tune in to this webcast and uh, ask us a question in the chat room. Um, but uh, so let's get back to the commodities thing for one second. Um, the other thing to be very careful about is that, you know, if you're buying a little teeny tiny bit of commodities and you're buying an exchange traded fund, well, you know, you pay the price every single time you make that purchase. It could be $8 or nine dollars or ten dollars so you know in some if it's a lot if it's a lot of small dollars going in periodically you might want to use an index fund to use a, a mutual fund you instead. know it just be it might just be cheaper for you and what percent is the target Joel? what do you think i don't know i just sold some uh, like a week and a half ago i i sold some when gold went to 1400 i sold some in 1500 so i'm you know my first job on Wall Street was a commodities trader. Did you know that? I didn't. Isn't I thought you funny? were a trader. I didn't know it was commodities. Uh huh. I had my little um, my little badge, my Comex badge. I was a silver, copper, and gold options trader on the floor of the Comex. So you're still trading then? Well, I can't say trading because uh, my father was teasing me the other day. He's like, "You don't even trade anymore." I said, "No." I said, "And actually, I'm making more money." <laughs> 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 but you know. Uh, 
I have a, I think, uh, I had had a, a 10% position, which is probably more than anyone ever needed. But that was because I was bullish on commodities a while back, and I'm, I'm under five now. Okay. So I'm, and I own oil and gold separately. I had sold out of my silver way too early. I sold out on the way up to 30. So I was like, wow, 30 <laughs> to 50, nice move, miss that, you know. <laughs> but it just shows you, you know what? If you pop it into a fund, you pop it into a couple of different things, you really are safer. You really are. The other thing is if you're an international investor, there are certain countries that where you might own a mutual fund that are very commodity heavy. So you got to be sure. careful with that also. You own a Canadian stock fund. <laughs> I guarantee you, you own a crap load of oil. Yep. You, it's, it's stuck in there. Same Australia. thing, Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, Norway, which I'm sure that sure. you own a lot of. <laughs> um, you seem sort of Norwegian. But anyway, so just be careful with that. Um, <laughs> That's... Otter, is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Swim something. I don't know. He's so they white. They drive sobs. I don't know. Very white. They drive a sob. What are you? That's all they have in Norway. What is your nationality? I don't even know that. Actually, it's funny. We have a genealogist in the family, and she's had trouble with otter. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but England, we think, with perhaps a little German. Yeah. Ah, very good. Very particular. Okay. <laughs> all right. Not a lot of good food on either side there. Yeah, that's Gotta true. Gotta tell you. Yeah, but good wedding recently. You know. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That is true. Okay, so let's do one last question. This is in honor great of... Great cars. Yes. Um, and in honor for Jack Otter, I will ask this question, who will be able to answer it in Lickety Split. From Henry, I'm 31-year-old. From Henry, can't be. This is, a, this is not Henry. I'm sorry, the name's <laughs> wrong. I'm a 31-year-old single female with two young boys and a salary of $1,200 a month. What is the best thing I can do to start saving for retirement and college for my kids? I'm also a college student at the same time. Well, single female, thirty-one, yeah. twelve hundred dollars a month. What? I don't even know what she's saving. It's amazing that she's asking I, I, the question. Fabulous, Very yeah. impressed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I think the first thing she has to think of is which one. And mm. as we often say, I'll let Jill use her favorite metaphor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, put it you, retirement first. That oxygen mask comes down. Put it over your own mouth and breathe in. Because and there's a lot of things she can do for her children, and that her children can do on their own to pay for college and get through it. There are no loans for retirement, as we always say. So first, I would start saving for retirement. In her case, either a 401k, of course, if her company matches. If not, an IRA or a Roth IRA. Uh, I might go with the Roth just because. You know, why, why pay taxes in retirement? Mm. I, I'm just going to say yes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Totally. Uh, all right. We want to thank Jane Bryan Quinn for showing up today. And by the way, fighting traffic again. Fighting traffic again. You know what we have to do? We've got to do the show from your apartment. Oh, that's a good idea. How hard <laughs> could that be? How here. hard could that be? <laughs> uh, nice view. <laughs> nice backdrop. I, I think we're uh, we I could think be we perfect. Should, I think we've got it. We just, I, yeah, I, don't think I, I don't think I want this on my walls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this will come right down. Don't worry about this. Um, check out one of Jane's amazing blogs and check out one of her books. Um, the big fat one, again, amazing doorstop. No, there's fantastic information in there. You know what? So I still have that book. I got the um, the new version of it with with everything being updated. But how many pages is it, Jane? Oh, uh, not there. Now there's a question I can't answer. Twelve hundred? Yeah. I think? Okay. So I'm just saying that like there is a Bible. And Jane wrote it. And if you have real wheel drive, you can put it in your trunk in the winter. Help That's those tires good, right, grip right. in the snow. Oh, wait, so. e exercise, buy two. That's a yeah. buy two. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, right. You need some dumbbells. Sure. Jane's got no. I mean, there's really. It pretty much covers everything. You don't really need to buy another personal finance book unless That's for we. Sure. You know, I mean, it really is sort of everything. It's the and Bible. so, it is um, so fabulous that you join us, and we thank, thank you, you so much. And Jane's blog, go to moneywatch.com, which is make the most of your money. Jack Otter, you need a blog. Yeah, well, we started from the editors, and right. uh, we just started last week. It has one post. That's from me. Uh huh. How's uh, that going so in between all the other 5,000 things you do? That's the problem, yeah. yeah. Mm. Poor Jack has to edit the schlubs like me, right? And he's <laughs> got to, like, say, ah, I guess he has to work with us, but he's got a lot to say. So maybe uh, your own yeah. show, your own blog. Stay tuned. Jack's, yeah. Jack's writing Sounds a good to Jack me. is writing a book though. That I, is true. I, so how's that going? Yeah. Uh, I got a meeting with the editor. This, in fact, this weekend, undisclosed yeah. location. Yeah. No fishing rod. No bicycle. Sipping soda. Just Southampton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just typing. Yep. All yeah. right. Well, that's great. Uh, Jack Otter, who is a fabulous font of information as well. Jane Bryan Quinn, experts as always. So thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to see you. Jack, say goodbye to the people. Uh, goodbye. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of CBSMoneyWatch.com. Every Wednesday, today's an anomaly. Every That's... Wednesday at 2 o'clock, we'll be here.
All right. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.